click record. Um, and I just want to again welcome all of you today to um, uh, the CELL webinar on teaching for growth and adopting an academic growth mindset as faculty. Um, you're going to see it's very interactive. Or we'll be chatting in the chat um, out loud since we've got a small group. We're even going to have a worksheet at one point too. So, um, so I think all of you will come away with some new insights. But um, what I want to do is begin, and so I just want to welcome Ansel, Shalise, Laura, Megan, Rebecca, and Teresa. And we have a really great diverse group of folks here from new faculty to junior faculty to Laura who works in student support services to um, uh, Rebecca in our history and Teresa, scientists and Ansul too. So uh, this will be a really great group. Um, so I want you all to think back to when you were faced with a failure in a graduate course or you felt stuck in some way. Um, and if any of you are like me, which I assume you are, your master's degree or if you did a doctorate was probably one of the hardest times in your life. Um, it wasn't an easy road. Um, uh, but we made it through. You wouldn't be here today if you didn't make it through, right? I know the requirement for this job is we need to have those degrees. Um, and so you persevered through it, right? Um, so think also then how you overcame that setback in your academic journey. What enabled you to break through, right? Really think about a specific example of, um, and I don't mean a failure in that you even necessarily failed a grad course, although I got a C in a grad course. So, uh, you know, so uh, some grades could also reflect some, some poor effort or, or poor outcomes. Um, but other reasons you may have felt stuck in your graduate class. And what I love now is to have some volunteers share aloud so you can raise your hand and then share with our group. We've got a really great, um, comfortable group here. Um, or you could type in your chat. So um, and if you type in the chat, clearly it, it, it's got to be brief, just kind of a brief way to summarize um, this challenge that you face in graduate your graduate course and how you broke through it. So, so I'm going to open it up. Would anyone like to um, share verbally before others will jump in the chat. And since we got a small group, I'm going to look forward to everyone sharing something. Any volunteers? Oh, Teresa, thank you. And then it looks like we've got um, Laura after that. So Teresa, go ahead, go first. Oh, I'll even share my camera. Um, anyway, or turn right. on my camera. Uh, so there is, I remember uh, my first semester in grad school in my master's program, it was a seminar and we had to explain a primary research paper. And I remember my, my advisor was teaching the class and there was a graph that I kept on explaining and he was just not getting what I was explaining. And finally he stepped in and he was getting frustrated and he explained it again. And I looked at a postdoc who was in the class and I was like, isn't that what I just said? And she's <laughs> like, yeah, you said that. But that emphasized to me clarity and explanations and always thinking mm -hmm. about how someone who is listening, even though I think I'm saying what I'm saying, they may not be getting what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Well, so and especially we know that is on that. And especially we know that in science communication, right? The need for science communicators, science to be communicated to other public audiences or even other experts. So, so the challenge was that you felt like you weren't being heard. You were even in many ways, in, on some days, I wouldn't even say shamed, but like feeling kind of like um, not getting strong, good, positive feedback from your professor. And then, but what helped you break through it was you learned how to kind of communicate your ideas more clearly. Now, how did you learn that later? Like what, where did you f discover that in grad school or in that grad course? It, it's just right. practice, like thinking, mm -hmm. okay, if I say it this way, is that really clear? I mean, mm -hmm. it, I don't think there's any way, other way to do it. It wasn't like the light suddenly, you know, wasn't like a, ah, and the God came down and <laughs> well, glamour, there, there, but it, it yeah. was, it was gradual. Okay. So grad, so practice, right? Kind of trial and error basically is what you're saying. You mm -hmm. sort of like in different, maybe you gave more presentations, some bombed, some didn't, you tried in different audiences, right? trial and error kind of helped you break through this and knowing that you would eventually get there that there were moments of 
success, right? Like you said, the postdoc kind of knew what you were saying, even if the professor didn't know. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah cool. Okay. Others, other stories, other things, and y'all can jump in the chat because we're not gonna have time for everyone to share out loud. So please share in the chat. Um, but I think it was Laura, you were going to share one next. Yeah. So, um, can you guys hear me? Okay. I got everything set up. Yeah, you're good. Okay, cool. Um, so I'm in, uh, doctorate classes right now in public administration. And I, this just this past summer took a marketing and branding course and I knew nothing about marketing and branding. And, uh, so I really felt myself floundering at the beginning. Um, we were supposed to do a marketing plan and I knew nothing about it. And I, you know, that it, it had been kind of, you know, easy so far, not easy. Like we had definitely worked hard, but this was way out of my scope. And, um, it, it, I did the old fashioned thing. I went to the professor <laughs> and I said, Hey, I don't know how to do this. I don't know when you use these terms, I don't know what they mean. So I'm not sure I'm doing this right. Please, you know, like not walk me through it, but you know, each step of each cause the marketing plan, he did, um, uh, a piece of it over time to add up to the whole thing. So over that time, it was, uh, it, it was old fashioned, you know, just ask the professor, talk to the professor, work out, learn something new and ask for the vocabulary that you don't have. Okay, cool. So for you, Laura, this was really about um, reaching out to other support services, right? Your professor, like asking for more help, not being afraid to ask for more help um, and then kind of finding other um, support tools, right? So again, that it wasn't just you who had to figure this out on your own. Um, it was the faculty member or, or you know, maybe um, like, uh, you know, other people who work on a university like you do. <laughs> um, great. Yeah. Others. Now, y'all, I want everyone to share. I just shared a pretty vulnerable one in the thing about getting a C in a grad course and going on academic probation, y'all. So I want to know who has a who has a bigger failure than that and persevered. But Ansel, go ahead. Yes. <laughs> no, I, I can't match that, Jamie. You know, I, I yeah. So for me, uh, the biggest struggle had been you know, just um, scientific communication in general, like during my, uh, you know, I would say a couple of years of my PhD, just presentation style. Um, again, you know, saying things really fast, which, you know, again, from coming from India, I didn't realize that you have to slow down, you know, people need to understand, take time to grasp that. So what helped me was uh, a lot of feedback, uh, you know, just going out talking to the faculties after the seminar like how was my presentation and give uh, you know just getting the feedback and actually uh, including that in my presentations um, and and again my phd advisor was uh, extremely helpful in this there's a you know he followed his own style he learned from his advisor so um, these are essentially you know m mixed bag of experiences um, has helped me uh, feedbacks has helped me really help me to you know strategize this so awesome Ansel thank you so I'm typing a little bit of a summary so far some of the ones we discovered through our stories um, and feedback is going to be a really important one Ansel later um, so uh, I'll share how I broke through briefly in a second but I want to hear from Rebecca because Rebecca you had raised your hand so Okay, I'm gonna see if I can share my screen too. Uh, I thought of two examples, um, both very different actually. In one case, it was a situation where I got just completely overwhelmed with coursework. I was in a graduate program that was on a quarter system. So the terms were only 10 weeks long, which is really intense if anyone's ever gone through that. And I got to a point where I just couldn't finish my final papers because they all piled up and I ended up having to take an incomplete which was something I had never done before in my life never considered and I can remember something that helped was going to talk to my advisor and being very open and honest about feeling stuck and at the same time I was going through something personal and I had decided to go into counseling for that and to see a therapist 
And it was really a question of working out the fact that my personal issues were creating a block in my professional life. And I hadn't really understood how those things were connected. So that was a kind of big picture example. And then I also had this memory of a smaller example where I was struggling with a paper and I couldn't figure out its organization. And so finally I just printed it out onto paper and I sat down on the floor of my apartment and I can still remember this and I cut it up with scissors. And so I just moved the paragraphs around, scotch taped it back together. And that was how I figured out the organization of the paper because I just had to see it visually all in one place. Awesome, Rebecca. So um, I have a very similar story as your first one, um, and I'll just type it in the chat in a bit. But what I love is that you're recognizing, right, that our academic success kind of or our academic challenges, right, are intimate, intimately connected to kind of our mental health and our well-being, right? And so then finding the resources for that and admitting, and I'm going to write this in my description, admitting right, that we're not perfect, that it's okay if we fail, we'll still make it through, you know, I think that's very hard for us as academics, you know, we're kind of, um, we're, we're the, the, the supreme perfectionists, I would say, um, and then I, and then your second story was really interesting, because it was about, like, study skills in many ways, right, I mean, we don't think when we're, like, writing a grad paper about that way, but that's really what you were doing, is sort of, like, how to organize your thoughts, and how to write out your thoughts. Um, so thank you for sharing that. And let me see, I'll just, um, just add it in the chat that similar for me, how I broke through no longer being on academic probation was also seeking mental health support, better balancing my work life and sharing my vulnerabilities, right? Um, and could make it through, right, um, in the end. Um, so um, let's see, Rebecca, it just popped up again. Do you want to say something else? Or that may have just been my delayed hand raise. Um, uh, no, I didn't raise my hand. Oh, okay. Sometimes, you know, collaborative, I didn't click lower hand, it pops up again. So, um, so I wanted to start us off with um, this conversation, because what we actually did is an example of teaching for growth. And specifically, we practiced a small teaching strategy for how to communicate for growth. So even for Teresa and Ansul, who are interesting in communication, right, we did a, a version of that. Um, and we shared, even though they didn't seem like it, we actually shared student success stories, but they were success stories about failing and getting up again, right? They weren't just the hero, right? The person who seems to just have a PhD and, and everything, and they're perfect, right? Some of you were probably like, oh my God, Jamie was put on academic probation in graduate school. <laughs> yep, you know, so these are success stories, but more realistic ones, right, about facing setbacks and getting through them. Um, and in fact, many of your experiences um, uh, reveal that we don't usually get up, get back up by ourselves, right? That we find someone who tells us to keep going, right? Like Rebecca shared and several of you shared your, your chair, your faculty advisor, similar to mine. My faculty advisor was like, Jamie, you can do this. You will, you will be successful. You will get a job. You will, you know, even though I didn't believe it at the time. Um, also, you know, we find someone to point us to other resources, just like several of you mentioned. Um, these were stories about not being good at something in school, but we persisted, right? They were stories about poor academic performance, at least in my case, especially. And yet we overcame that by doing X, Y, and Z, right? Um, these are stories about how our intelligence is not fixed, but incremental, that it grows, even like Teresa's example, that through trial and error, she became a better science communicator, right? It wasn't about her intelligence at not being a good communicator, right? Um, um, you know, and maybe at some point in your careers, you thought you weren't smart enough. You know, oh, can I, can, you know, maybe you feel a sense of imposter syndrome even still today, but, but you ultimately proved otherwise, right? So these were stories that were filled with growth language. Um, and then I made many of you communicate for growth. Now, if y'all were in my class, so let's say we were, y'all were undergraduate students and I was teaching a class. I would then actually ask you, y'all are the A students, right? You're the, uh, 
the uh, star top students who persevered, I would then ask you to write letters to future students in my class about how you succeeded through these setbacks, right? How you faced this setback and overcame it. And then I pass those letters on to my students during the first few weeks at the beginning of the next semester. So that's the second small teaching strategy for growth. You've now learned two of them. One, how to communicate for growth through stories that are success stories, but very honest and transparent about um, uh, overcoming setbacks and the specific strategies we took to overcome those setbacks. And two, having your students write those stories out and then you share them with, um, with students in the, the next semester. And maybe some of you have already heard about these strategies. Um, so those are just two. We're going to talk about a lot more today, including you're going to develop ones that even I couldn't find in the research or that you might develop on your own for a class this, this fall semester. So the uh, goals and outcomes, hopefully, for our webinar today will be you're going to uh, learn the psychological concepts of growth and fixed mindset, if you don't already know that, which is undergirding this discussion. Um, we're going to talk about the importance of growth mindset for VSU's diverse student body. We're going to apply growth mindset to our roles as faculty, as teachers and scholars, which we've already started to do a little bit with our stories. And we're going to develop syllabus and small teaching strategies for growth. So we've got a lot to get through in the next uh, uh, 40 minutes. So um, I'm going to move on quickly to the research behind some of this. And I know a lot of you are coming at this from different angles. Like Teresa, you've probably been to a bunch of mindset conferences with the USG. Some of you, this is an entirely new concept. Some of you, like Megan, this is maybe even discussed in your field of psychology. Um, so, so bear with me as I go through some of this research, but, um, but um, you'll see how important it is for VSU. And then um, um, you know, I'm going to share some critiques of it before we start to apply it to our classes. So <clears throat> study after study reveals that college students who have a growth mindset and faculty who teach for growth motivate students to work harder, persist in the face of academic challenges, earn higher grades, and increases student enjoyment of learning. And as we kind of shared with our stories, Teaching for growth can also counter feelings of imposter syndrome and self-blame, especially for, um, ah, yes, Megan, especially for first-gen students and students from diverse backgrounds that make up a significant portion at VSU. So growth mindset and teaching for growth is extra important for VSU and our student body. And this research stream began with Carol Dweck. There's a picture here on the left. She's a professor at Stanford. And in the late 1990s, 1990, she began this research mostly studying children in K-12 and how they coped with cha academic challenges. But she expanded it to higher education, um, parents and employees. And so you see some, a bunch of citations from her research, as well as her best-selling book, um, which was published in 2006. And since then, other psychological and educational scholars have applied the scholarship, including James Lang and Flower Darby in their books on small teaching and small teaching online, and even Angela Duckworth's book on grit. And all three of those books are really kind of bestsellers. And I know a number of you have read some of them or parts of them or attended webinars on them. Um, and then in the bottom left-hand corner of this slide, you're probably like, what is that? Um, that's a clipping from an Inside Higher Ed column just last year, I think, um, where a scholar critiqued, like an, a higher ed administrator critiqued some of growth mindset, um, arguing that college professors are mis misunderstanding the concept and then that's even harming students. So I wanted to give that as an example and I'm gonna refer to some of that critique later um, in the webinar, just so you see sort of how this research stream has been moving, right? Began with Kara Dweck and K-12, moved into higher education, and then like every theory and research now, there's a lot of critiques of it and refining of it. So we will address some of those um, as we go on today. Um, but some of you who may not know the kind of core of the concepts, you could be wondering right now, well, what is a growth mindset versus a, six mind, a, a fixed mindset? And how are we implicated? So, um, so, and again, maybe you've seen some of these posters before. So key findings from this research. 
um, that praise for effort or growth, as I mentioned, motivates students to work harder, persist, earn higher grades, and increases their enjoyment of learning. And as I mentioned, exponentially benefits diverse students. Conversely, when students face failure, and we can see this in our own stories of being grad students, and are only praised for natural ability, then they more likely give up in challenging situations. Their grades drop, they may self-blame like I did when I was in grad school. I felt like I wasn't smart enough and I, it was my fault, right, that I got this C and that I couldn't make it through. Uh, they even tend to ignore feedback at that point, sort of in, a, in giving up. Um, and there are some kind of common phrasing that you can identify uh, someone who thinks or um, approaches things in a, in a fixed versus a growth mindset. So, and I'm going to use myself a lot here today. I was that typical student throughout K-12 who said, I'm not good at math, right? I'm not good at math, right? That's sort of this fixed essentialist notion that I will never learn how to improve or be better at math, right? Humanities faculty, we often say that a lot. So I have a growth mindset about that I can't learn and grow to uh, improve in my math skills, right? And, and the research shows that's going to have a serious liability for me. Um, and But if I shifted my phrasing, this is the kind of power of yet poster on the right, I'm not good at math yet that reveals kind of this opening for well i'll struggle but yet you know i could get through this and or get better at it now similarly you see growth and fixed mindset occurring when in how we respond or give feedback like ansel said to students who do really well so again this concept of growth and fixed mindset is not just about underperforming students but actually you're overachievers okay so how often have some of y'all written, and I'm guilty of this, um, on a student paper, great job, you're so smart, right? Or great job, you're a really great writer. <laughs> Guess what? Carol Dweck's research says that's actually doing a disservice to the student as well, that that's a fixed mindset about their intelligence. Rather, a growth approach would have been saying, great job, what's one thing you could have done even better, even better? So the kind of um, the column, the kind of diagram there on the left, I know it's a little small, but kind of goes through um, the kind of liability of what happens if you have a fixed mindset or you talk to students or approach teaching with a fixed mindset, right? That students are more likely to give up. Um, even a student who's doing well will then ignore, you know, improvement themselves. Um, or then when they face a challenge, they then um, won't uh, be able to overcome it. Um, again, so this is not just about underperformers, but you're often high achievers as well. Um, so keep, keep that in mind. But basically to sum it up, growth mindset leads to academic achievement. Um, and growth mindset research is positively correlated with better emotional and physical health, along with positive social relationships. So we're talking mostly today about the higher education academic context, but um, it's related to our mental health as well. Now, um, here's again something I just still want to emphasize before we move on. Um, again, at the other end of the spectrum, fixed mindset is a liability. I put that in kind of that yellow kind of star on the left hand corner. Um, and Carol Duckworth, I thought, um, uh, Angela Duckworth, I'm sorry, used that phrase. She said, having a fixed mindset can become a tremendous liability. And she writes, getting a C or D grade, a rejection letter from a journal editor, right? We all know this. Receiving a poor performance review can derail people with a fixed mindset. With a fixed mindset, you're likely to interpret these setbacks as evidence that after all, you don't have it. You're not good enough. You're not smart enough, okay? So um, one critique of the literature though is that this binary, and many of you who maybe, Teresa, have gone to these mindset conferences, I've always thought, wait, this isn't a binary. We don't, I don't walk through the world just as a fixed or a growth mindset. And actually Carol Dweck um, reminds readers that we do have a combination of both of these mindsets. Um, and, and Duckworth even talks that most people have sort of this inner fixed mindset, right? The inner pessimist in us um, alongside this kind of growth optimistic being. 
so the goal is to embark, they say, on the voyage of moving toward endless growth, even if or when we waver. Okay, so I wanted to address that critique today because it was one I had that it the theory kind of comes off as a binary, but um, Dweck and all the researchers are saying that we have a little bit of both, but the goal is to kind of move continually toward growth. Um, similarly, what do professors do with this? Well, some of the most recent research is showing that instructors own mindset. So your own mindset is related to student success. They found that courses taught by a faculty with a fixed mindset had achievement gaps that were twice as large as courses taught by faculty with a growth mindset. Oof. That's a lot when I read that, right? So this means that our mindsets as faculty, right? Hence why I wanted to start this webinar off with our mindsets really matter. Not only will we be able to persevere as teachers and scholars, like with Rebecca's example of making it through, uh, you know, this assignment or um, uh, on Sewell's example and Teresa's example of becoming better science communicators. So you will become a better scholar, a better teacher with a growth mindset, but we will be happier. We will be more successful, but also with a growth mindset, we're more likely to enable our students to have a growth mindset if we have one too. Okay, last critique. I know this is a lot. This is the like, you know, lecture point. Um, one final critique of the concept of growth mindset, and I'm always kind of critiquing theory. So um, I know some of you are invested in diversity and equity and inclusion like me. And so one critique I've always had of growth mindset theories is that they, they lack a structuralist critique, a structuralist analysis of inequities. So I wanted to read about that a little bit. So yes, a lot of progressive educators are arguing that too, there's been too much focus on the mindset of students, which ignores structural problems in education, right? Inequities in the classroom or in our society. But the research still supports the power of mindsets, that the research is still solid. You know, we will never change, um, uh, you know, we're never going to be able to cure or change all of these structural, educational, social ills. Um, so I guess what I'm saying is that, yes, this psychological research is more focused on kind of the internal and the micro even while the macro challenges still exist. But the research still shows that, that these internal small teaching strategies for growth can still um, um, result in improvement and growth for students. So that helped me uh, kind of just put aside the structural critique that the research still is solid, even if that those structural inequities um, still exist. So, um, so keep that in mind that um, that these we can't cure all those structural issues, um, but one way to put this into practice and things that we can control are using small teaching strategies for growth in our classes. That was a lot, and I usually don't like to lecture, but I want to open it up quickly for any questions if you're confused, especially if this is an entirely new concept for you before we move on, because the next thing we're going to do is actually apply this to our classes. Any questions? Please raise your hand or type in the chat. Okay, you guys ready to apply it to your classes? Well, then we, well, that's what we'll do. Okay, okay. So here's what we're going to do. And uh, oh, June, I see you're now with us. Um, June knows I love my Google Doc worksheets. So I'm putting in the chat a Google Doc worksheet, and if everyone can open it up, you're going to have to now kind of have two screens going. Um, and um, please open it up. And I'm going to go over quickly what's on the Google Doc worksheet. Some of them we've already discussed, but basically for the next 20 minutes after I go over them, y'all are going to um, have time to fill in. We're going to collaboratively, all of you have editing rights to this right now. Um, so, and I see all of you kind of picked it with those weird, funny little animals at the top. Um, we are collaboratively going to fill out this Google Doc worksheet. But let me first go over some of the additional strategies on here that I haven't talked about yet. Um, um, yet. So, as you can see, I've listed already eight small teaching strategies for growth from the research. 
And then on the second page, there's room for us to add more eventually. And we are going to eventually also add how you're applying it to your class. I already discussed the growth letters from future students. Okay. We also already, so we already discussed number one. Um, I talked a little bit about two and three. And um, I want to expand a little bit on two and three and then quickly go into the others. So two and three, as I mentioned, that's about um, um, the growth language, right? The using the yet, the kind of even encouraging the high achieving student to even do more, things like that. Um, that's kind of what it means by growth talk in class. And then the growth language and feedback, some of those were examples on Sewell. This is getting at what you, you talked about earlier with your story. But I want to give you guys another example of, um, of growth feedback you might give students. So again, I mentioned this, I think, but you might have written, which I did plenty of times, you're a great writer, or you told a student in office hours they were smart. I have definitely done that, especially um, to male students. And right, I already kind of see the genderedness of that. So changing that growth language and feedback to a student would then say, rather than you're smart or you did a great job, but something like excellent work. This was a challenging paper assignment, but you applied the strategies we learned in class well. So again, the student just doesn't think they're naturally smart, but they, you know, follow these particular strategies to get there, right? Or growth talk in class would be something like a professor saying, um, y'all, actually I heard this yesterday even, you know, we've often heard some faculty will say to undergrads, this class is like a grad course. So if you're not ready, then you may want to start rethink taking the class. You know, that, that's not growth talk. So you might rephrase that as saying, even sharing your story, right? Oh, um, or a student who started off thinking they weren't good at math, but they attended office hours, they got a study buddy, and they ended up getting one of the highest grades in class. So that's another example of growth talk in class. Okay, hold on, because I think we're, you all get those. I'm going to go quickly now through growth um, language in the syllabus. Okay, growth language in the syllabus would include maybe if you had a section on tips for success in this course, maybe you annotated your syllabus for growth. So you, um, uh, you literally annotated it, like you put little talk bubbles, kind of like maybe on the section about um, some policy, you then also gave them strategies for like overcoming and, you know, persevering through that policy. So that would be, again, how you annotate your syllabus for growth. And here's another way you could um, include growth language kind of with a syllabus. I reviewed a VSU, fac a VSU faculty member's online course in Blazeview last summer, and he had growth language throughout his getting started module where he uploaded the syllabus. And even in his welcome video, he included kind of these growth, this growth language. So, so really start thinking again, how you can embed growth language in things like your syllabi in some of your modules. Okay, five, and I know I'm going through these fast, but I want to have time for y'all to apply and work through them. So growth grading, ooh, growth grading. This is where you design your grading scale and even your online quizzing. So you reward for growth. So let me explain that. This is where you allow students to fail. Remember, that's what growth is about. Failures, not just A's. Fail and try again without their grades suffering, okay, or suffering so much by weighting later assignments more heavily and gradually in sequence. So here's an example. This would be not a growth grading scale, and I had plenty of these when I went to through grad school, right? You had, you know, three, three, 20% short written papers, and then you had a 50%, I didn't add those up correctly, but you know, you had like five short papers that were worth 10%, and then you had one big paper that was worth 50%, okay? That, the five papers that are 10% are not weighted. Those are not allowing students to kind of improve and grow through them. And then you have this huge assessment at the end. So a growth grading scale would be where they incrementally grow, right? So it would be 10, 15, 20, 25%, rather than 15, 15, 15, 25, 10, 10, 10, 10, 50, okay? That's what the research says is growth grading. Um, another example of growth grading, and this will fit into number seven, too, but it's called mastery quizzing. And actually, Teresa, you might find this interesting because it relates to 
what you shared a little bit with the, at the Dean Director's Retreat. So there's a concept called mastery quizzing where you set up your quizzes and you could do this online so the students can take them multiple times until they master it by earning 80% or more, for instance, or they have unlimited attempts, right? So like, I think I've done that with um, like, um, you know, some of the trainings we have to do through HR, right? It allows you to keep taking it until you get to an 80%, until you pass or, you know, master it even more than passing. So it's really cool when you think about grading and quizzing, you can embed growth even in your design of that. Right, by allowing them to retake it until they master it or in, when they have unlimited attempts to do it. Okay, six, and by the way, you will have time to kind of reflect on this as it. Okay, growth goal setting and reflection. This is where you have students set goals and write reflections on where they are in the course, where they need to be, and where or how to close that gap, okay? So for example, a student may set a goal to earn a certain grade on an upcoming quiz, okay? So you would have them before they took that quiz, write a reflection about where they're at, right? Where they need to be and how they're gonna close that gap, right? So they would work to improve and then dissuade themselves from thinking their traits or skills are fixed, right? Um, Similar, you could have online students submit a goals or learning contract in the first few weeks of class by stating like two goals, like for the course, right? So this is like a growth kind of goal contract. Things they're gonna do to achieve those goals in the course, a challenge that they will anticipate um, over, um, coming up, and then how they're gonna overcome that challenge. So again, not just a goal like I'll take action on this or I wanna get an A in this class, but what challenges do they think might come up to prevent them from getting an A and then what strategies will they take or might you help them with to get that A, to overcome that challenge if it's procrastination or it's work-life balance or it's internet connection, right? So growth is, again, always about the challenge and overcoming the challenge, not just the success. Um, let's see, number seven, growth do-overs. So I already mentioned the mastery quizzing, which is kind of like a do-over, right? You just keep taking it until you get 80% or whatever. But they, there's also research in the small teaching book about um, you could do this with assignments too, like um, allow at least one assignment per course to be redone or open for revision with no points lost if the student also submits a reflection on the steps they did to, to improve it, right? So I know a lot of writing professors do this where they'll allow students to resubmit a paper if they then write a reflection on the feedback they got from the professor on how they're gonna revise it and how they did revise it. Um, and the, the books also mentioned celebrating mistakes. Again, that like in class, you could have students share and work through their mistakes with them, but tell them to keep going and point them to the resources on how to do it. Now, again, you wouldn't um, grade that. All of these are ways they're not um, feeling like um, their grade is gonna be impacted. Okay, last but certainly not least, growth role models in the profession. Um, every month or every week, um, awesome, Teresa, cool. Every month, so you'll be able to share that in the Word doc. Every month or every week, start class by sharing an example of someone in the profession, your field, who made a difference amidst diversity. Again, not, I've seen faculty do this where they have students present sort of, you know, people in the profession, but it's always like the hero, right? Growth is about the person who persevered through those challenges. So you would share stories, maybe news stories about someone who made a difference, but amidst diversity, right? They overcame these obstacles and then became successful. Um, and you could turn that over as an assignment for students, right? That they could find these stories, right? Or you could tell stories about yourself, how you failed and got up again and how you did that like we did at the beginning of the webinar. Okay, so I just talked a lot and Teresa already added a great example in her um in the chat so now i'm going to turn it over to y'all for the next 10 minutes to start filling out this worksheet and it's a collaborative google doc so if you've never done this you're going to see like it's going to start moving as everyone types in there so 
you may want to jump to the bottom or just not everyone start with the first one, although I say that and then no one's going to start with the first one. Pick one that you really want to start working on um, and uh, type your name, type your course, and then explain how you could implement it or maybe you already do implement it. But I would challenge you to pick one that you, um, that you haven't tried yet, right, given the explanation I just gave. So I'm gonna kind of sit here and just watch and as y'all type, everyone will see each other's and um, we're gonna learn from each other as we type. So this will be about 10 minutes um, and then you'll see we're gonna have kind of a reflection activity on this. But if you have questions for me while we're going through this, please um, type them in the chat or you can even raise your hand and I'll call on you. Again, I challenge you to, even if you include something you've already done, like Teresa did in the chat, challenge yourself to kind of come up with a new one based on um, the strategies I just went through. And try to give some specific examples. So, Laura, I see you typing about growth language with the access office. What give give me a phrase, for instance, that you literally might use, right? You can take one and rewrite it to another. <laughs> Good, you guys are doing good. Let's see, Rebecca, oh, there's Rebecca, okay, good. And yeah, I know you need, you guys need time to think too, so I'll be a little quiet here. And if you finish one box, jump into another box. We can have more than one person in each box as we see a couple. and challenge yourself, go into a box that makes you really uncomfortable and just type it on here, give it a try. See if you can try fleshing out how you might do it. You know, this isn't a 100% commitment, <laughs> although I'm hoping it, it becomes that, but you know, if you're like, oh my God, I don't think I could ever do the mastery quizzing or celebrate mistakes. See, flesh out maybe how you might do that for one of your courses. Give it a try here, just on the Google Doc, right? We're kind of imagining and redesigning and rethinking. And then, yeah, I love it. Someone now is adding more, which is exactly what I wanted. If you have a new, um, a new um, strategy, perfect. There's an empty box. Let's try to fill it in. See if you can give it a try. Mm, good, Laura. I now see that you kind of took a common statement you might hear from students in the access office and rephrased it for growth feedback. Good.
Good. Keep jumping. You guys are doing awesome. Whoop. Awesome. Keep jumping around, adding more, reading each other's stuff. I love that you're sharing your own struggles. That's exactly the point of this. Awesome. Yeah, and we'll have time to kind of share and work through maybe some continual challenges y'all are having with some of these. <clears throat> um, and if someone posts a question in here and you want to try to answer it, y'all, you can go ahead and answer it with like a highlighted, um, um, okay, with a highlighted um, or like a different font color. So June, I'm gonna to try to answer your question here while we wait, while people are still filling stuff out. Let's see. Let me turn off my speaker. Okay, so y'all um, keep adding a few more things in or reading or trying to answer each other's questions. In about a minute, I'm going to pull us back together. Uh, Gio and I was just trying to figure out the name of that software that I remembered was in Blazio. It's called Perusal. Sorry, my sound again, I'll turn it off.
Okay, I'm going to come back now here. I assume you all are kind of reading some awesome stuff we have on um, on the, uh, the Google Doc here. So I'm going to move forward to um, the kind of summary wrap ups uh, questions we're going to have. And I'm going to take this away from the screen because I assume we're going to want to talk through some of the questions you guys pose on your Google Doc. But what I'd love everyone to do now is uh, go around and either share one of your remaining questions that you have. So maybe it's one of the ones you post on the Google Doc for us to try to answer. Um, or um, share something today that you were surprised to learn, right? So either share in the chat your question or raise your hand and uh, we will kind of have our kind of wrap up discussion and of what we learned and how we might problem solve some of the remaining questions. So does anyone want to start us off? Um, and you could point to kind of a part of the Google Doc if you have your question written there that we didn't answer. Yeah, Megan, go ahead. Yeah, I was surprised. I didn't, the thing that I didn't think of was like that our own language, like that we're using could affect people and that we could, I always have a hard time when I'm grading, I get like in this zone, I guess I could do a better job of being more growth related when I'm grading. Cause usually I just get in like the zone and just mark everything that's wrong, but I guess I could do a better job of like doing that. And then the question I had was in the growth goal setting and reflection. I really want to do more reflection based kind of things. And I was trying to figure out how I can incorporate because in some of my classes we either have like in statistics, they have an assignment that's very similar. Um, they do it and then they do a, another assignment that's also very similar. And so I was thinking maybe they can reflect after they do the first one on what they could have done differently or what their goals are going to be for this assignment and what they learned from the last assignment and what are they going to do differently. And I figured I could do that same thing for other classes that have papers that are in different parts that they submit. And I didn't know if it could should be done like in an online discussion board. That way other people, other students can see and they can also see that other students are struggling in probably the same areas that they're struggling in. Or if that would discourage some students, maybe they wouldn't want to disclose their um, things that they're struggling in. I didn't know what people thought about that. Well, I have thoughts about that, but y'all want to, anyone else want to jump in? And by the way, if you can show your camera, that would be great so we can see you. But I understand if folks have stuff in their background. Um, um, it's just my I mean, rem me. remember that growth, it, you know, I recognize we don't want to kind of um, escalate anxiety in class. Rebecca, this came up in that, that session we had yesterday. So Megan, I, I guess my answer to your second point of like, would students feel discouraged? Well, not if, if you've set the tone of the class as a growth class. Do you know what I mean? So that's why I think role modeling for you would make it feel safer for them to then kind of share visibly. But but maybe what you could try is the first, if you ended up doing this for like you said, two different assignments, you could do the first one, they send it, they send it to you individually. So it's a little more safe, you know? And then maybe the the second one or the one later, they then share publicly. That could be a more like incremental way of them building the confidence to share their failures. But I mean, Rebecca's done the thing with letters and you know, that's, I know it's like you're giving it to other students, but they really actually, the way growth language works is it feels empowering, you know? Cause it's like, wow, that person too, you know, struggled and got through it and this is how they did it. So, so does that Megan? Yeah, June, you wanna give an answer to Megan? Go ahead. Um, I <clears throat> Excuse me. I think it can. Do I have a Halloween? Um, I think it can differ based on the content that you're teaching. I've tried um, um, for for like a project where you do more of a qualitative writing, your, your students. Um, I've done a discussion board where students share their work, like peer feedback works in that way where students see others work and then they feel like, oh my God, you struggled in the same way I did. Um, I make it a requirement so that students read some of them and then give comments on certain aspects. I guess that's needed um, for this to work because otherwise they don't read. <laughs> but um, for a like things like statistics course, um, what I've done is to share the um, class means and item specific um, 
means so that they know where in the content that the class entire like as a whole has have struggled and i think that helps um them to see again that they're not the only one if they got it wrong great all right thank you june for jumping in so i see a couple other questions I know um, someone wrote in the Google Doc at the end, I think my problem is not with distrusting students' ability to learn, but their motivation to master. Maybe because I deal with grad students who are working professionals. Do you know if the literature on growth mindset says anything about this aspects of classroom problems? Um, so what's interesting is most of the growth literature is being done on, as y'all saw, K-12 and then undergrads. Um, I mean, I'm sure there's stuff on graduate and that kind of was, you know, we gave an example of that with my stories at the beginning. Um, I would have to kind of look that up for you um, because as we all shared, we just all gave examples, right, of, of this occurring in our graduate experiences. So I, I would say it's probably still very, very ac uh, applicable, um, even if the focus right now is more on undergraduate student retention and success. Um, but I guess my other question for who wrote this is, um, you say other aspect of classroom problems. So, um, um, you know, was there a particular other problem um, you were, or maybe I'm misunderstanding the question. Not who, sure who asked that. Was that you, you June? Yes. <laughs> oh, it was. <laughs> I'm the only one who's teaching 70, or who referred to the seven, seven um yeah 700 level um i yeah. noticed that um other yeah people, you're the only well, one today but not at the university right um yeah. i feel like some of the things that i've tried in the course um i've had a feeling where um i'm just becoming more well, that's critical and then more lenient on the grading so that they can keep trying. Otherwise, I feel like I'm cutting back their intention to try harder. I don't know. I, it's just, so, it, it's hard so, to describe. So I'm going to be a little blunt with you. Aren't we given trial and error opportunities in our career as working professionals? I, I do that. I mean, <laughs> I, it's not the issue of whether I should do it. Well, I guess it is to some extent because I I get every instructor has an expectations as to how far you want to move students forward mm -hmm. in a course, right? But um, I didn't know about growth mindset, but um, in the course, because I wanted to improve my teaching, um, a lot of them included um, and um, providing more structures and then more chances. Um, and then in the end, I have, well, at least sometimes I have been concerned if I am not doing what I should be doing. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe this is about your growth mindset. <laughs> maybe. So yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, I know you well, June. So I'm kind of, you know, playing. But really, I mean, I think, and this goes back to someone wrote, and I kind of said a big learning outcome for this webinar was our growth mindsets, right? We're stuck in this perfectionist model too, right? We're stuck in this high achieving model too, that things have to be done a certain way in order to achieve success, you know? So, I mean, I, you know, in the end, yes, I'm going to want you to consult with your own grad faculty in your department. I just um, want to jump in. I, I remember what could be a key contributing factor to my concern is um, our program is constricted by the program assessment. Um, and then external evaluation standards. And then we have to assess my stu students according to that rubric. And then the way the descriptions are written in the rubric, like whenever I grade, I'm, I'm feeling really bad because like it says exemplary and um, model to other yeah. students. And then yeah. it's just, I don't know, it, it's that internal struggle. <laughs>
Yeah, so what you're getting on is actually what the webinar I'm doing in half an hour on is that a summative assessment is not a growth mindset. Right, right? Yes, I mean, that yes, is the, that's, the, that's the struggle. Fundamentally, summative assessment, right? That's the difference between summative and formative is not set up for growth. So you're, so that, I, I hate to say, but that's gonna be kind of a perpetual struggle is finding that right balance. Um, but you know, maybe you can ask your program, even if it's not in your accrediting standards, maybe y'all can ask your program to include growth in a learning outcome, like create a new program learning outcome that's about growth. And then that can help you with some of your, you know, your struggles in, in that. Um, um, so, <laughs> um, so I know we're at time um, and y'all, um, here's the thing, I wanna make sure everybody downloads this Google Doc. Um, so please, if you've never taken a Google Doc download before, go up to file right now, go up to file, go to download, and then download it if you want it as a Word doc or a PDF. So everyone download it right now. And um, what's really cool now about this worksheet is all of you have examples, not only this list of strategies, but examples from other students, other people's courses, as well as your courses on how you could do this in your courses. And still some challenges, which I love. I love that, excuse me, so many of you discuss challenges and then we just try to problem solve how to overcome them. Um, so, uh, so I know it feels like we need more time and we're out of time, but you know what, in many ways that means it was a good webinar, right? Provoked your thinking, got you moving, got you doing uh, the hard work of applying this to your courses. Um, so, but I do want to be mindful of everyone's time. So, um, I will stick around if you have a few more questions or you want me to kind of try to work through one of your remaining questions. Um, and I'm going to post this in the Blazeby 101 webinars along with the copy of our Google Doc. But um, if you want to stick around and we can try to work through one of your questions, I'm happy to do that um, and hope you kind of had some good takeaways from today. So, so thanks everyone. Yep, share the worksheet, share it with anybody and everybody, right? <laughs> well, That's what it's you know, for. Thank you everyone. You know, and this was very, you know, that word file is a very good idea. Everything is compiled there. And thank you so much. It was very, I, I was taking down notes as much as I can. Good. Yes, yes thank Good. you so much. Yeah. Well, and I'll upload the PowerPoint and the and yes. the webinar in, so you will you can always go back to the PowerPoint to get all yeah. the resources. So, because yeah. I actually, you know, I know you'll maybe want to go back to some of the theory too. So you won't, you know, imagine I had a page open. I, I was trying to buy the yet poster there. So that oh, I in my office. Oh, but, you uh, can buy I it. Think, That's a good idea. Yeah, I think we should, I, I, I'm going to have that in my office just to look every day because uh, for me, it's very important as, as a person. Right? You're so right. Powerful. Yeah. It's very powerful. Yeah. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, so it looks like looks like Laura's going to try to get one too, maybe for the access office. She works in the access office. So, yeah, okay. yeah great. Awesome. Cool, Ansel. Well, Thank I'll you. see you in a bit. Yeah. Yes. Bye, -bye. Bye everyone.